Hi, I'm Alex, and today I want to talk about a very interesting but also important physical property that needs to be taken into consideration when doing positron emission tomography, and that's the so-called positron range. Well, what's that positron range actually all about? From physics point of view, when an uh, when a positron is emitted from the nucleus, it travels a finite distance before reaching an electron there. It produces two photons that can be detected, saved, and reconstructed to a final PET image. This PET image actually shows the tracer distribution of the injected tracer. And this tracer distribution, this map of the tracer distribution, is highly dependent on the physical properties of the injected tracer. And one of these physical properties is this one. The distance between point of emission and point of annihilation. That's what I want to talk about today. This is the positron range. Positron range is, as you know, dependent on the electron density of the material itself it travels in and on the emission energy of the nucleus. Therefore, we need to talk about PET traces. One of the most common PET traces is fluorine 18 based PET traces. And fluorine 18 has about one millimeter positron range. That's not much, and that's good that it's not much, because what the um, actual PET scanner will see when imaging a geometry like this filled with fluorine 18 is nothing more than this geometry with a little bit of blurry on the sides. But this can be actually not taken in consideration because this is in water maximum 0.6 millimeters, something around. So this changes dramatically when we increase the positron range of the traces we use, for example, iodine 124, gallium 68, where we are in a positron range a regime of about three millimeters. And this three millimeters, when we do the same scan, we would see not something like this, but really a blurred out side that in the end makes the contrast, uh, decreases the contrast, decreases the delineation, makes it for the clinicians very hard to interpret the image. A quantification due to positron range effects can be drastically this is this deal with this problem. We realize that the positron range needs to be corrected for. And that's the normal approach. What we do is a so-called deconvolution. What we do in deconvolution is that we take the blurred image, use an algorithm as a post-reconstruction technique, and what we get out after this is an image that is corrected for positron range. A little bit of noise is induced to be that deconvolution algorithm. Nevertheless, it deals with the blurry. This is standardly implemented in PET CT. Uh, what we do now, and what I do now in my PhD thesis, and especially here at this work, is to get this deconvolution to the next level and introduce some questions we can ask. What happens when we go from a PET CT to a PET MR eye scan. Well, PET MR, as we know, deals with external magnetic fields. So, what we did in the first place was to make Monte Carlo simulation and ask ourselves what happens to positron range when we have external magnetic fields, since we know that the Lorentz force is, a, a, is forcing a charged particle like the positron onto a spiralated path. Well, what does it do? We, we did the Monte Carlo simulation set up as follows. We set up a point source of, first of all, fluorine 18, iodine 124, gallium 68, as well as rubidium 82. We used these four traces. And what we did was we placed the tissue around it in bed. The most important tissues are actually water, bone, Lung. And in the end, we not only want to simulate a PET CT, so what we did was we simulated on along the main axis of the scanner a magnetic field in direction Z, and this very we varied from zero Tesla, which actually re represents a PET CT. Uh, we varied it 
towards a Greek Tesla, which would mimic a clinical fMRI. And in the end, we went even up to 9.4 Tesla, which mimics a clinical fMRI. What I did then was what I got from the simulation are for zero Tesla, as expected, a kind of spherical annihilation point cloud. But what happens when we increase the magnetic field strength along the z-axis? Well, the annihilation cloud spreads with the direction of the magnetic field and decreases in the other directions, meaning it gets a little bit more elliptical. And depending on the tissue density and depending on the magnetic field strength, it gets higher and higher in one direction and lower and lower in the other two actual directions. Nevertheless, this was the output of the Monte Carlo simulation. So what I did was to parameterize this output. We parameterized it in a formula that represents the positron range in dependence of the magnetic field put along the set direction. This parameterization I implemented directly in an already existing deconvolution algorithm called the Richardson algorithm for PETCD and therefore expanded this deconvolution towards a setup that can be used. Now, for tissue dependent positron range correction of iodine, gallium, and rubidium, not only for PETCD but also for PET MRI. That's what I did and that's what we also want to publish. The link to the publication, if it's out already, you can find below if it's out um, the third round. Nevertheless, this is now what we have. The next step will be now to team up with Siemens Healthineer as well as Ma University of Madrid and try to figure out how we can put this concept of a deconvolution as a post-reconstruction technique towards the reconstruction, uh, wild reconstruction algorithm. Nevertheless, this is work of the future. If you want to stay in, uh, keep in touch with me, you can find um, you can find a link to our homepage where actually my email or my phone address is. Um, if you like this one, then let me know by thumbs up. Just subscribe for the channel and put on your notification bell just to be informed that all the other videos are my colleagues. Nevertheless, check out our YouTube page and our website. See you soon.